Welcome to People and Profit. I'm Stephen Carroll. And I'm Kate Moody. Today we're looking at some of the biggest business and economic stories of the year that are still making headlines as we begin 2022. Coming up. Inflation hits the highest level in decades in Europe and the United States. How long might it last and what can policymakers do about it? The rising cost of energy and shipping are two big factors making goods cost more. Is there a solution in sight to either problem? Plus, the quit-demic, returning to the office and the need for family leave. We'll look at how the pandemic is changing the way we work. Now, the pace of price increases is maybe the biggest story in the global economy this year. Inflation hitting levels not seen in many years, squeezing consumers and businesses. Kate, take us through what happened to inflation this year. Well, Stephen, prices have risen in most parts of the world. In the United States, consumer prices jumped 6.8% in November. In the Eurozone, inflation hit 4.9%, the highest since the bloc was founded. Now, a number of factors are at play here, including rising energy prices, supply chain disruptions, and a surge in consumer demand after the first lockdowns. We'll be coming back to a few of those issues later on. Government and central bank stimulus measures have also added to that trend. They've fueled spending and kept interest rates low to encourage lending. The International Monetary Fund has warned that countries should be ready to tighten their monetary policy before inflation gets out of control. Remember that inflation in moderation is good for economic growth, but if it outpaces wage growth, it can make life too expensive for many workers. It's the job of central banks to control inflation. What have they been saying about it? Well, they're facing this very tricky balance of trying to unwind their emergency pandemic stimulus while keeping inflation in check. For a long time, policymakers in the US and EU insisted that these price surges were transitory, that they would ease soon. But the Federal Reserve did back off that stance towards the end of the year, acknowledging that inflation was likely to remain above the 2% target for some time to come. Overall, inflation is running well above our 2% longer run goal and will likely continue to do so well into next year. While the drivers of higher inflation have been predominantly connected to the dislocations caused by the pandemic, price increases have now spread to a broader range of goods and services. We understand that high inflation imposes significant hardship, especially on those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials, like food, housing, and transportation. We are committed to our price stability goal. We will use our tools both to support the economy and a strong labor market, and to prevent higher inflation from becoming entrenched. One of the big factors driving inflation in Europe has been the rising cost of energy and natural gas in particular. Gas prices in Europe soared in 2021 to record highs that were in fact multiples of previous records. Now this was partly due to increased demand as economies opened up after lockdowns, but also partly due to the weather. So colder temperatures in spring in Europe meant that we used more gas than usual for heating uh, at a time of year when Europe is normally building up its stocks. Then the summer was hotter than had been expected as well, which meant there was more demand for air conditioning. On top of that, the continent's key supplier, Russia's Gazprom didn't increase supplies to pre-pandemic levels. The result, stockpiles were run down and prices went up. Gas is really important for electricity generation in Europe as well. That's meant that it's another bill that people have seen go up in Europe in recent months. Russia has gradually increased supplies in recent weeks, but James Waddell from Energy Aspects told us earlier this year that prices were likely to remain high well into 2022. If Russia was able to ship more gas into the European balance, that would quickly reset uh, Europe and bring prices back down. Now, we think Russia is upstream a little bit constrained this year. There has been a lot of production growth, but there's also been a lot of growth within Russia for that demand. And we've got to remember that Russia is itself a huge gas market, almost comparable with the uh, Europe's entire gas market. And because of that increase in Russia has left very little uh, extra gas to come into the European balance. So this year is looking very tight. Next year, it does look looser. We should get more gas coming into Europe and that should reset things. But it won't be a reset to anything near like what we saw in 2020. And even, even the long-term averages of prices, we're still looking at structurally higher prices going forward. Another issue that is contributing to price rises is the cost of getting goods from A to B. 
Now, the pandemic has disrupted what had been a very finely honed and interdependent global supply chain. The semiconductor problem is a good illustration of what's going on here. More than two-thirds of the world's microchips are produced in Asia, and they're used now in everything from phones to cars to medical equipment. There has been an explosion in demand for all things electronic, and the industry has simply been unable to keep up. It's still struggling after its factories were closed at the start of the pandemic, and now there's this explosion in demand. We've seen shortages and delays in industries across the board. The shipping industry has seen huge bottlenecks, uh, container ships that are unable to dock and offload their goods. Many businesses have now turned to air freight, but prices have hit record highs, doubling in the last three months of this year alone. I spoke to Willie Shee, professor at Harvard Business School, about the scale of the problem. It, you often hear the word unprecedented, but I think most people who have been in, who have been in the logistics industry for some time have never seen anything quite like this. The pandemic has really uh, disrupted not only manufacturing in locations all over the world, but it has created bottlenecks as we've seen demand shifts, demand surges with consumer spending in the United States, for example, just overloading the capacity of the Trans-Pacific and East Asia to Northern Europe uh, trade links. So the scale of the disruption is really massive. Let's turn next to some changes in the workplace. And we spoke to a lot of experts about this in 2021. The Great Resignation, the Quitdemic, whatever you want to call it, people in some parts of the world, at least, are leaving their jobs in greater numbers than we'd seen before the pandemic struck. In August alone, around 3% of the American workforce quit their jobs. That's 4.3 million people. A survey by Randstad in the UK found that almost one in four workers planned to change jobs in the next three months. It's not universal, though. In France, the unemployment rate is now back at the level that it was at the start of the pandemic. Plus, the proportion of people at work is at a record high. It's a similar picture in other European countries where governments had put in place furlough schemes which maintained people's salaries and kept them attached to their old jobs they were able to pick up as restrictions had been eased. There are lots of reasons that people are choosing to change jobs. More financial security because they saved during the lockdown, worries about safety in the workplace, childcare concerns. I talked about this with Daniel Chait. He's the CEO of the recruitment software company Greenhouse. He's written a book about hiring called Talent Makers. In the very first line of the book, we say the war for talent is over and the talent has won. What we mean by that is people are in more in control of their careers than ever before. So it's easier to find out about new jobs. It's easier to apply to new jobs. And then when you add on all the dislocation that happened in 2020, people are now able to work remotely at so many more companies than they did before that the universe of possibilities is just even more widely you know, opened up. And then you add into that the idea that people are kind of taking stock of their lives. They may have been dislocated or moved out of a big city. And it's sort of an opportunity for so many people to sort of reconsider what is it that they want to do next in their career. It's just like all happening at once. Another factor that's forced people to rethink their careers is their ability to take time off. Yeah, the pandemic has sh thrown into really sharp relief uh, the difficulties of balancing professional and personal obligations, especially when schools are closed or a family member gets sick. Now, many governments offered varying degrees of financial support for workers who had to take time off, but the burden of caregiving fell disproportionately on women around the world. That forced millions of American women out of the workforce in 2020 and 2021, and it has led still more of them to reconsider their careers. In the U.S., we've seen growing calls for policies that would ensure paid family or sick leave. Elise Gould from the Economic Policy Institute said the pandemic has exposed the weaknesses of the U.S. labor system. What this pandemic recession has done, it has revealed the cracks, magnified the cracks that we already had in the system before. We had already seen in the United States softening women's labor force participation over the last 20 years. We had seen many decades leading up to the year 2000 of increasing participation in the labor force. But over the last 20 years, that has softened someone in the United States. We're not seeing that in many of our peer countries, um, in Europe, in Canada, and elsewhere. And I think that is due to many of the policies that other countries have that the United States doesn't have. Paid sick leave, paid parental leave, paid med medical and family leave for taking care of family members and children when you have a new child in the household. Also, we don't have uh, the kind of safety net that's provided for childcare. And those kinds of things are keeping women from realizing their full potential in the formal labor market. 
Well, another long-term issue that employers are struggling with is striking a balance between office work and remote work. We've seen big companies have to change their plans on several occasions on this issue in response to the evolution of COVID-19. If we look at the tech companies, Twitter has told its employees that they can work from home forever. Facebook's parent company, Meta, is letting people apply for permanent remote working roles. Uh, at the start of December, Google actually pushed back its plan to move people back into the office. But as for the long-term question of what the right balance between remote work and being in the office uh, should be, I keep coming back to a conversation that I had with Professor Leslie Wilcox from the LSE at the end of 2020. He explained what the academic research says about this. What we're finding, uh, we've been researching this over about five years now, is that when you've, you get to 14 hours a week, the, the net productivity benefits fall away, both for the individual and the organization. And the, the social disbenefits tend to kick in. People start feeling isolated. They start getting bored. They start uh, not being able to structure so much of their time after two days uh, a, a week. That's it from us for now. But you can watch all of these interviews and much more on the France 24 website. You'll also find us as a podcast wherever you usually listen. And if you'd like to get in touch with any comments or questions, you'll find us on social media. Until next time, thanks for watching. Goodbye for now. Versailles, Mont Saint Michel, the Louvre are well known stars of French heritage. But French genius and France harbors many other hidden treasures the arts, gastronomy, architecture, as well as nature's wonders. Come along with France 24. Discover France's living heritage. From young apprentices to accomplished craftsmen and farmers to Michelin star sporting chefs, meet these people whose passion for their professions preserve and drive French heritage. You are here on France 24 and France24.com. The Gulag saw millions detained and tortured during decades until 1953. Though the repressions of Stalin may seem like a distant memory, historical truth is still a struggle. What is the story of the Gulag? What is the story of the Gulag? What is the story of the and in modern-day Russia, many live in fear of a state that silences all criticism. Watch The Gulag Revisited on France24 and France24.com.